Next, from the state capitol, we talk with two leaders in the legislative effort to fix the state's broken pension system and what reforms are being considered. We'll hear from Republican State Senator Bill Brady and from the chairman of the House Personnel and Pension Committee, Democrat Elaine Neckritz. This runs about 35 minutes. State Senator Bill Brady and Representative Elaine Neckritz, thanks for joining us on the Illinois Channel. Thank you. We are looking at the issue of pensions. It's the, one of the primary issues that uh, everyone is focused on down here and for, I would say, for good reasons. But I think there's still a lot of people around the state that might be asking, why do we need to do anything? Why are we focusing so much on the pension issue? And I think they also may be asking as taxpayers, you know, if I don't work for the state, if I'm not a recipient of the benefits, how, if in any way, does this affect me? Uh, Elaine, you're the chairman of the House Personnel and Pension Committee. You've held a number of the hearings on this issue. Why don't we start with you? Why can't the state just continue with the pension benefit structure the way it is? And what, if anything, needs to be done? Well, we, we could continue on that direction, but the, the trajectory for the cost of the pensions would really force us then to make significant cuts in other areas of, of state government that, I've, you know, that, are, that are important, uh, education, public safety, health care. Uh, and so if we're going to balance all those things and, and really provide services that the citizens of the state of Illinois need and want, um, then we're going to have to do something about about the the trajectory that the pension payments are on, and you know there's a number of a, a number of ways we can do that, and all those are being explored. Uh, Senator, what are your thoughts on? Well, you're, you're right. It's not a very exciting topic, uh, but people like Elaine and I who've uh, delved deeply into this over the last decade have seen this coming around the corner, and if we don't do something it will end up absorbing such a significant portion of the state resources that we won't be able to do our job in other areas. Uh, there's a lot of important issues, uh, business issues down here for job development, Medicaid, uh, but none probably more important than fixing the pension problem uh, in this state. Uh, we pay out over eight billion dollars in benefits every year. It, it consumes a great deal, over six billion dollars in revenue of the state budget every year uh, from general revenue funds. So it's very important that we deal with this, that we we bring parity to it, uh, and we give some strength and stability to it for the recipients. Uh, we're over $80 billion unfunded. In addition to that, we've got over $15 billion in pension debt. So uh, it's a very serious problem, and it racks up pretty quickly. And as I understand, this goes back to the 1995 law when they, they passed a new well, law to fund the pensions, but they, they didn't have a level payment like we might with yeah. a mortgage. They kind of had lower payments in the beginning and then it ramped up. Well, there's no question. I, we, one of the first issues I tried working on, and back then I chaired the pension committee, was uh, the 95 law where, where we were able to uh, convince Governor Edgar, let, let's face it, uh, many governors uh, and let general assemblies pass budgets that didn't fund the pension liabilities, uh, but we convinced Governor Edgar that we had to have some system to stop this. Uh, he was struggling with budget crisis as well, uh, so we agreed to a ramp uh, where it took us about 10 years in the formula to actually get to a level percentage of payroll and then amortize that over the next uh, f total 45 years to get us to 90% funding. It was the best we could do then. We put a continuing resolution and thought that where people in the past uh, would not take a vote uh, necessarily to fund pensions, they would never vote against funding pensions, and that's what they'd have to do. But unfortunately, in the last decade, uh, governors and members of the General Assembly supported budgets that didn't fund pensions, and the problem grew astronomically to the levels we're at today. Can I just, I, I don't think the problem started in 1995, though. I mean, it, is, it, it was a problem that's been accumulating for decades. and. Uh, if, you, uh, if you look back at the history of the 1970 Constitution, at that point the pension systems were approximately 40 percent funded, which is about where they are today, um, and that was what brought about the the, the clause in the pension in, or the, the clause in the Constitution that protects pension benefits. It was because we were so underfunded that at that point that was their effort to try to get to, to, to try to get to resolution on this issue. <clears throat> and, and let's go to the legal aspect because there's been a lot of debate about whether. Uh, the legislature last year passed a bill that changed the pension formula for those who would be hired after January of 2011. But the question was, can we change the pension benefits for those who are current state workers? 
uh, you just alluded to the Constitution, and there's, uh, I think, uh, a, a paragraph in there relative to that that some have argued about the meaning of that, whether we can change it going forward or not. Do you have any thoughts on that, or have you heard from any legal testimony on whether or not there's going to be a legal challenge to uh, changing the benefit formula? I, I, I would be shocked if there was not a challenge to whatever to whatever we do, um, if if the if we pass something that impacts current the, the benefits for current employees, those who are already hired. There's a myriad of legal th thoughts on that, ranging from you know, well, just simply saving the systems are so underfunded that if we simply save them and prevent them from going insolvent, um, that is that satisfies the Constitution because that would not be a diminishment or an impairment. In fact, we're saving the system. Um, all the way to, well, we have to have, uh, we have to uh, offer each employee a contract, an offer, acceptance, and some consideration for that contract. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're I, I, I think that the road we're going down right now, I think what those we would consider to be sort of the, the most conservative, the safest constitutional um, path we can take in order to make sure that we survive a challenge. I think she's framed it pretty well. There's those of us who don't necessarily believe we need to go to the links we're going to to solve such a serious crisis. <clears throat> but there are others who, who refuse to believe that we can do anything unless we enter into a contractual exchange. Now, clearly, uh, Mayor Emanuel just came down this week and offered his pension revisions, and he doesn't believe there needs to be a contractual uh, obligation, and he's got attorneys that tell him it will hold up in court. Uh, the Civic uh, Committee of the City of Chicago believes you don't have to have a contractual obligation, but there are some legal opinions that do. We just agreed to choose to try to come up with a solution that entered into the contractual, believing that uh, more people are of the opinion that that would stand up to a constitutional test. And that very uh, agreement is what has really created the framework of the discussion. Uh, because if you're going to have a contractual agreement, the, the reforms have to be appetizing enough for people to accept them to save money. So you're, you're dealing in, in not a, a dictate, but an offer and acceptance. And if you make it too expensive uh, for the offer, too expensive for the people to accept, you end up without the reforms you need. You know, I want to go back just a little bit and spend a little more time on where we were before. It, Again, we talked about why we need to do it, and you had mentioned the $80 billion and, and the ongoing, and, and in fact, the tax increase that was so controversial that was passed in last year brought in in the neighborhood of $6 billion. It kind of depends upon how the economy overall is doing, depending upon how much money comes in. But that money is going entirely to pay for the pensions. But the good news is we're not borrowing to pay for the pensions anymore, at least we're paying for that. Uh, you mentioned how the, the, the term we often hear is crowding out, that as the pension grows and grows projecting forward, you're going to have to be cutting back on what you spend on education, on a myriad of other programs, or it's transportation, whatever. So I guess that's one way that the average taxpayer who's not working for the state would be impacted by this issue. And, and <clears throat> that's in fact happening this this year, which is creating a lot of the the, cri the, the crunch we have in the budget. <clears throat> the increase in the pension payment, just the increase in the pension payment for the for the fiscal year starting July one, um, is a billion dollars. Our entire anticipated new revenues is about seven hundred and fifty million dollars. So right there, every new dollar is going to into the pension system, and we're having to make cuts in the vital areas that you m mentioned, education and so forth. In order, in order to just make that pension payment, so <clears throat> that we need to bring that that down. And then the other area would be, and Senator, you're a businessman. Uh, to what impact is that going to be on the state's ability to draw new business into the state? That's that's really the key growth, right? Growing the economy, growing the Illinois economy would generate right. more revenue. But yes. how are we going to draw more businesses if we have this overhang of debt that yes. I would think any business would be threatened by? Are you going to pass a major new? Yeah. tax increase to pay that off. Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, there are several factors that businesses weigh in on whether they're going to expand or bring a business to an area. Uh, one has to do with the climate, uh, workers' compensation, unemployment insurance, infrastructure, and all the important things that businesses rely on and, and costs that they have to deal with. Another is the stability of the state. If the state's going to continue to increase taxes to meet its obligations, they're reluctant uh, to invest here, which is why we opposed the tax increase and really believe that the pension solution has to allow for the tax to fall off according to statute, uh, why it's so important. So businesses do look at that. 
but they also look at bond ratings, they look at stability of the state, because they're looking at long-term investments uh, in a state that unfortunately has been operating on a short-term leash. And that's why I think that the pension uh, piece to the puzzle in solving Illinois' overall problem is probably a foundational uh, systemic change that we need and then build on the rest of the things that need to happen. But if you don't solve the pension crisis in the state of Illinois, you, you really are just nibbling around the edges and the business community sees that. What, let's talk a little bit about some of the solutions. So we have this massive funding problem. Costs are going to be going up faster than the income. How do we get a handle on it? How do we change this around? Well, one of the most significant discussions that, that, that Senator Brady and I are involved in um, with, with, along with the governor and, uh, and, um, and other House and Senate members is, going at, is looking at benefits. Can, can we reduce some of the benefits that are, that are offered and are set in statute right now? Um, because if we don't do that, we really can't bring it under control, I don't think. And so uh, the biggest cost driver among those, those benefits is the 3% annual compounded cost of living adjustment. It's really just an annual adjustment that, <clears throat> that annuitants get once they retire. And that constitutes about a quarter of the cost, uh, that one benefit. So, so that is where we're, that's our, our number one target um, in, in looking at trying to bring that in, under control. So the 3% compounds, compounds. So if we start off like $10 the next year, you get $10 plus 3%, then 3% on top of that. Correct. And when you extend that across it's the, miracle the of billions of dollars that we're doing in pensions, it adds up. The miracle quickly. of compounding interest, yes. The change would go to a simple 3%? Or, or is it going to be no, eliminating I think, I think it, Well, I don't think we would eliminate it, but I think it's going to be doing, in order to achieve the savings that we need to achieve, it would be more than just making it simple. And so I think there's a, there's a variety of things on the table right now, maybe setting a, a, a floor. I don't know, I don't know the right word for that, for that well, but, but just some sort of a, a base on which you would get your 3% compounded COLA. I may call it, you know, 20,000, your first 20,000 of the annuity. Um, <clears throat> so that you would still get the miracle of compounding interest, but above that, uh, you know, there, there would be no COLA. Or we would have a reduced COLA on the entire annuity. There's a range of things that we're still, that we're still looking at. When you, when you talk to, I'm sure you hear from constituents who are working for the state who would have their benefits cut and what kind of things are you hearing? I mean, did they... Well, I think it's important to note that the first thing we did is we sat down with the people who represent the state's employees and they realize we have a problem as well and it needs to be fixed. And we said to them, under this concept of a contractual offer and acceptance, uh, what would be most appealing to you? And they came back to us and the, realizing that there would have to probably be increased contributions, b benefit reform, they said, we'd really like to see uh, a more stable uh, system or source of funding in statute. And so I think it's important that them realizing that we have to make some of these changes, but what can we give them in exchange for that that makes this appealing? And clearly one of the most important things to them was a better source and more reliable source of funding, which we've worked very much at length with their attorneys and others and I think we've come to a good agreement with those representing the employees uh, that on that language then the concept was to guarantee the funding it's got to be something we can afford as well uh, I think it's important to note we've, we've never talked about taking away COLA uh, it's just that many of the actuaries and others tell us that a three percent compounded COLA is not in the real world sphere. And so a more reasonable, more uh, appropriate COLA in line with actual cost of living is what we're talking about. Uh, no one's even suggested less than what tier two employees would receive at this point tier in time. Tier two being the newer employees that came in after January 11th. Exactly. So uh, we're not eliminating COLA, we're just tinkering with it, frankly, to make it more reasonable uh, in terms of current conditions, but also in terms of uh, being able to stabilize uh, the funding mechanism. And so that's important to note, I think, in the process of our discussions with those who represent the employees. So if we don't do anything, the fact is, I think, I, let me ask, suppose this yeah. as a question, is it factual that the system would just implode and then maybe there wouldn't be the benefits? I mean, you have to do something, right? Well, what would happen is more money would be taken from classrooms, uh, 
more money would be taken from corrections, more money would be taken uh, from those who need health care services if we were to live in a confines of a balanced budget. There's a statute that says you have to fund the pensions and it comes out first. If that continues, uh, more money would come out of state employees' health insurance. So, you know, it, it hasn't reached a point where it consumes all of the budget, uh, so, but it is a, a alarming, growing at an alarming rate that, that's going to cause even more severe cuts than what we need to make if we solve the pension program in these areas. So it, it, it affects everything as, as we look at state resources. I don't want to get too deep into it. You know, these things are, as you are both involved in negotiations, so I don't want to spend too much time on what one side proposed versus another because it's fluid. Uh, but on the other hand, I would say this, that uh, if we have five different pension systems that are being funded. As I understand, the primary one is the teachers' pension. Is that right? They constitute about half of the half of the going forward cost and half of the unfunded liability. So they are the it's the largest single group. And Speaker Madigan said, I think he once said, if I'm quoting him right, 56 percent of our problem is the teachers' pension system, and they're not even state employees. So. One of the ideas that was floated was to shift the cost from the state to local school districts. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And if that happened, what would what would happen to property taxes in those school districts as those districts had to incur that cost? I'll let you start. Well, let me first point out that our working group with Jerry Sturmer, uh, the four legislators, and the, have made, a, I think, a great deal of progress and agree on a whole host of areas, from increased contribution to guaranteed funding to insurance reforms to COLAs and, and really the fundamental things that would could save us nearly a hundred billion dollars over the next 30 years and provide us with a hundred percent funded system. So we, we've made a lot of progress. There are a couple points in which we continue to disagree and you're, this is one of them exactly. Uh, we don't believe that it's appropriate, particularly before we face a constitutional challenge and other things, uh, to shift the ills of la past general assemblies and governors onto locals. Now there's no question that what we're doing is pushing normal costs uh, onto the employees by increasing their contribution and reducing their COLA, but this concept of increasing the liabilities associated with what we call the legacy cost, the unfunded liabilities to the locals give us great cause for concern uh, and to date we've been opposed to it. Because of what you mentioned, uh, it will either increase tuition dramatically at colleges or property taxes dramatically for community colleges and schools. Uh, these schools are strapped and they tell us there's little room for them to go but to property taxes. And if they can't go to property taxes because they're capped out, then it hits the classroom and the teachers and and this is the concern that we have uh, with the uncertainty of of that and I would agree I think that this is a this is a, a real policy disagreement and which is perfectly fair here in, in, in with the Capitol um, wh what I would uh, say is that th I think that there's I think that there's real policy value in aligning the uh, the, the body that actually making the decisions on salaries um, for for teachers with the folks that are that are paying those those the, the benefits associated with that, and so by by pushing some of the, some or all of the normal cost onto the the district, you would be aligning that so that so that when a school board is making a decision about a compensation package, they're going to have to look at all the costs associated with that. They can't just say, well, we're going to award this salary increase, and then someone else will pay the pension benefit associated with that. So that's the that would for be um, to my mind the policy goal behind this. I, I think the senator's right that if if we uh, do some of the reforms that we're talking about, the the level of the of the shift would be actually, you know, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of three to four percent of payroll. And if we do that over, I'm just gonna throw out a number, a five year phase in, <clears throat> I think that for a lot of districts that's affordable. There's no question there are districts that, that, that can't take that on and we would have to we're gonna have to find a way to deal with that. But I think that again, you know, that sort of al al <clears throat> aligning the and, and making aligning all the appropriate incentives within one decision-making body, I think, um, makes some sense for stabilizing the pension system going forward. Let's talk about the the governor when he gave his budget address, uh, announced a committee that you both serve on. What, so you've kind of alluded to that. Where does that stand? Uh, 
<clears throat> well, we, we continue to work. It's it's you not originally, as... Originally, I'm sorry, you, weren't you originally supposed to have some findings by April 14th? Uh, well, 17th, 17th is when, and we, and we really gave the governor uh, our best uh, findings. It wasn't in consensus on all issues, but we gave him uh, the information that he pretty much took and ran with. We, we also told him that this is not as easy as maybe as Elaine and I make it sound on this show. Uh, there's a lot of details that we're really continue to be concerned about. Uh, when you're talking about billions of dollars, uh, you want to go to every length you can to have actuaries double check and see and so forth. And particularly when you're talking about a system where you're going to have offer and acceptance and some people are going to take the offer and some are not. And not knowing uh, what they'll be thinking when presented with this offer, it's, it's really hard to project. So in the confines of the way we're trying to do this, uh, the bill that we pass, we, we still won't be able to be deliberate about the savings until we know what the reaction is of those who have that opportunity to accept the offer or not. And that causes us for even greater detail. So we're still discussing issues uh, like retirement age. Uh, the governor wants to take it to age 67. I think that would be counterproductive in the scheme of this offer and acceptance in terms of savings. So we, How, we still have a lot why, of... Why would that be counterproductive? Well, the, the point being is you save the most money if the people take the offer. But if they're afraid of extending their work years to an age of 67, we've already seen a number of employees run to the retirement lines by the threat of that. I would caution them not to do that, by the way, because the, the legislation under which we're working for, they'll have a choice to make and they'll have a more informed choice if they wait. Uh, but they ran to the lines and by, I think it was mostly by that threat of age 67 for retirement. Uh, so we have to be very careful in how we lay this out. Uh, we also have the issue of insurance that we're continuing to deal with. The House passed a bill on insurance yesterday and health, health, care, health insurance. Health insurance, yeah. excuse me, yeah. Yeah. on health insurance that ties into retirement benefits. And uh, I would say that the, the House did it with a great deal of leap of faith based on uh, a paragraph from the governor's office, Jerry Sturmer. Uh, but we have a lot of details yet to be seen. And the idea is that the, those retirees would start making some payments on their health insurance? Well, as you know, the governor laid out a budget that eliminated the teacher's retirement health insurance subsidy and only funded uh, about 60% of the uh, other retirees' health insurance liabilities. So he, he's called for increased retiree contributions and employees in his budget. That's what we're trying to decipher, how, how we deal with that in a, a fair and equitable way that doesn't put people who are relying on a $15,000 a year retirement package now being forced to pay uh, a $12,000 a year health insurance because they aren't Medicare eligible. A lot of details in this that we've got to filter yeah. through. And <clears throat> I think there's been some, there was some feeling that, well, once the working group came up with its proposal, we would be done. And I don't think any of us in the working group ever thought that that would be even close to the case. <laughs> I do feel like about 90% of what the governor announced when he made his announcement was also the, the consensus of the working group. And, and <clears throat> Senator's exactly right. We're, we, once the governor did that, we were back at work, I think within the next couple days, digging in and saying, okay, now, now we have this framework. Where do we, you know, we, now let's start digging into the details. And that's exactly what we're doing. There's so many details on here, and I don't want to take too much more of your time. Uh, and I'm skipping over a lot of the details just so that I try to keep this on the higher level, I think, rather than get mired in dollars. But w as you got on this working group, was there, and you've both been working on these issues for a long time, so was there anything that shocked you, uh, or were you pretty much already aware of every, all the information that was coming in? <clears throat> there are points along the way at which some some of the numbers um, I find shocking. The, but certainly the, the mag we we both knew the magnitude of the problem and the fact that the problem had to be addressed. But you know every once in a while there's a new number that comes out that you're like wow I didn't know that and then you know we have to uh, take that into account. But uh, but but most most of it's just been um, educating ourselves and starting to think about how okay now now if if, if the cost of living adjustment is going to be handled this way. What does that mean for 16 other things that that impacts, and 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 that's it's been that more, mostly that kind of work. It's it's really I guess like punching numbers into an equation. If we change this, how does that change the dollars over? What what period of time are you looking to get the system funded, 
and and then the question is at what how much do you have to be you talked about 100 percent funded but since not everyone retires at the same time uh, it's a little bit like saving yeah. for your kids college if they don't all go to college at the same time you don't have to have 100 percent of it in there at one time at what level are we out of the woods is it 90 percent is it 80 oh. percent and then over what period of time i think it's fair to say we want a hundred percent solution we we don't want to leave a legacy of problems for others and one of the things that those representing the employees and us clearly came to a conclusion was uh, let's get to a hundred percent under GASB actuarial guidelines and, uh, and that's our goal we, we when we establish that no one's tinkered off of, off of that and uh, we we're, we're going to continue there we don't believe there is a solution that falls short of a hundred percent within 30 years and, and just to put a number behind that, if, if we were to, to get to 90% funded by 2042 or 2045, whatever the year might be, we would still owe $32 billion. So it's, it's a little hard to think about going through this entire exercise of being disciplined, making the payments, and then at the end of it all, we still owe 30, over $30 billion. Just seemed to make sense. It, and, it's, and it's not the, the, the additional payments that we would be making over the course of that year, those years, um, don't significantly add to the overall uh, burden and so it just made I, I, the numbers made sense to get to 100%. Um, I'll try to condense this. There's just a couple other things I want to follow up. And, and one of the things is, you know, I, the state has uh, a firm running the lottery now. And I've sometimes when when you look at how did we get to where we are, it was a variety of things. Mm -hmm. One was the overall economy. We've, we've had a weak economy and so we haven't had the revenues. But the other is the state didn't make all of its payments, cut back or skip some of its payments. Uh, Sheila Weinberg, who runs Truth in Accounting, we've interviewed her in the past. She calls it as she looks at different states, not just Illinois, uh, political math. So one, and I sent Senator Brady, I think you referred to, are you gonna use actuarial accounting, not political math? And secondly, should the state be in the business of running these pensions? Because we don't know that politicians in the future, future aren't going to tinker with this again. Or should we say, you know, if, as a corporation might, maybe you have a financial portfolio manager running these and just doing it professionally without the concerns of how much are we going to spend on transportation or infrastructure or education that year. You just say, here's the system and we're going to run it and, and maintain it. Well, the answer to the first question is that there will be no political math. The 30 year Gasby actuarial definitions are being used in, in the legislation as we draft it to make sure. I would say that our systems are very professionally run. Uh, and the point is that governors and legislatures who've passed budgets didn't make the payment. And, and that's the problem. And this, taking the system, giving it to someone in the private sector to run, still won't make the legislature or governors make the payment. So you've got to have the discipline and the responsibility to realize that. That's why we're enhancing the strength, going beyond just a continuing resolution to make the payment, but bringing it up to some sort of contractual obligation uh, to make that payment. So uh, we know the teeth needs to be in there, and, and there has to be more to force the legislature and governors to make the payment. Doesn't matter who's running it. Most would argue that those systems have been run well, with the exception of some of the corruption during the Bogoyevich years. And uh, we've tried to do things to reform that so, so no one could abuse the system again in that way. Uh, yeah, I, I, would, I would agree. I was going to make a point, but it just like completely went out of my mind. <laughs> Let me ask you to speculate just one. I, I, I know myself, as I listen to this and hear the Mayor Emanuel speak and, and things change, it seems to me something's going to be done. The question now where I'm asked you to speculate is when. Do you imagine knowing what you know now and 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 knowing where you need to go? As you say, it's kind of a an, such an involved process, you may need more time. Do you imagine the legislature, A, would do this by the end of May, and we're taping this on May 10. Or do we have perhaps a special session that needs to be addressed after you get the budget done? Or third, would it, as we have the Madigan Amendment coming up to the voters, uh, would it be better to wait until we see how the voters vote in November on the Constitutional Amendment? 
Well, it would certainly be my hope, um, and I'm still cautiously optimistic that we can actually get something done by the end of the session, by May 31st, because the, every, every six months we wait adds another four to five billion dollars onto that unfunded liability. So that, that, does, that just digs a hole deeper and makes it more challenging for us to, to solve it. Um, so I, but all, all of those are possibilities. I, I personally don't think we need to wait to hear what the voters have to say on the constitutional amendment requiring a supermajority to enhance pension benefits. Because um, I think the voters have made it pretty clear what they would what they would like to see done. They'd like to see state government be stable and fiscally sound. And I couldn't agree more that this is w w the cornerstone of making that happen. And do you, do you, did you want to come? No, up? I, I simply would agree. I'm cautiously optimistic that something would happen before the end of May. Uh, if it doesn't. Uh, I think we've got real problems, and frankly, if I were governor, I'd call a special yeah. session. Yeah. I would agree. We, we have a, uh, we have a, the governor's now negotiating the new ASME contract. Uh, we don't want another generation of elected officials not being under uh, uh, things as, as we do this. So uh, I think it's got to happen before May 31st, and if it doesn't, the governor should hold our feet to the fire and keep us here uh, to get it done, because it's, it's, is, is, Representative said it's a cornerstone uh, to solving this, the problems of Illinois state finances. You got a lot on your plate. You got Medicaid reform. You got the health insurance that you referred to. You've got the pensions. You got to pass the budget. Would it be better, given the complexity and the huge issue that this is for the future of the state, to say, let's just buy ourselves a little more time? Let's do it right. I think part of the fear is politically, you're going to get one bite of the apple. You're going to make these changes, and and I don't know that you're going to come back and tinker with it again for some years. So you want to do it right. Would it be better to set it aside and say, let's focus on this in June? Or do you think you can, the legislature, I don't mean you as individuals, but the legislature can have the time to get this uh, put together, uh, given where you are at this point? Well. As the senator said, you know these are these are issues that have been talked about for many many years. And while there are details to be hashed out, I think the concepts um, and and even some of the drafting has been underway for quite some time. So this is this is not something that we're that we're on sudden, all of a sudden on May 10th we're saying, oh my goodness, we only have three weeks to, to completely draft a bill and to and to out, you know to put that together. These things are, are underway, and so I, you know, for those of us that are intimately involved, as, as Senator Brady and I are, I, I think that it's very possible to get it to get it all wrapped up. Here's here's another question. I, I will wrap up, but uh, Senator Brady uh, referred to people quitting. This is something I thought. To, when would these? If we passed a bill in May, when would it take effect? Would it take effect in the new fiscal year? I've had some, I've had just, and you too, I'm sure, heard any number of state employees are going to be leaving before July 1st because they don't want to be impacted by the new pension changes, whatever they would be. And I didn't, so when would, well, when would it take effect and is that going to be a problem? Do you let think me go back state? to a misunderstanding. And the misunderstanding is that they, something would be imposed upon them. They would have a choice, uh, every bit and better choice if they stay in state government until it's taken. What, I think what we envision is we pass legislation, uh, CMS or whoever, or the systems probably, would uh, draft the offer and acceptance to the employees. They'd have a six-month election period to say, you know, I, I'm not going to take the offer. I'm going to keep my benefits uh, that I have today. And uh, they can keep working or not, but uh, really no reason to retire There's based no on what. No financial incentive for them to leave. No, in fact, I would be, I would, I would re refrain from making any decisions right now until they know something about their health insurance. Yeah, I, I would really agree with the senator on that. I think it, that that <clears throat> that there is going to be a choice to be made, and they need to understand what that choice is rather than simply running to the door. I think that's an important point. I, I've heard just in one college, I don't want to name it, that 200 people were planning on leaving, and you go up. Of we, I think this is frankly we can't afford it. We we can't afford to lose that talent uh, in that mass, and so uh, we're very concerned about that. Well, we uh, I, th I, I think we hit the high points and then get too yeah. marked down in numbers. Uh, it's a huge issue. We appreciate you taking the time to explain it, and good luck to you as you go forward and uh, putting together this bill. Thank you. Thanks appreciate so the opportunity.
You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel to gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. 